Good day and welcome to the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials COVID-19 conference call. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Dr. Nate Smith, Secretary of Arkansas Department of Health. Please go ahead, sir. Hello. Uh, welcome to today's media call with the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. Uh, thanks for joining us today. My name is Nate Smith, Secretary of Health, the Arkansas Department of Health, and President of ASCO. These are scary and unprecedented times for our nation. The number of reported U.S. COVID-19 cases is rising quickly. More than 10,000 people have died from coronavirus in New York State, which is the epicenter of the outbreak in the United States. And across the country, the death toll is now over 22,000, the highest count of any nation. This increase is expected given an increase in testing and ongoing rapid spread of disease across communities in the U.S. While these numbers are concerning, the increase is not unexpected. Right now, we're preparing for the next phase of COVID-19 response and recovery efforts. During today's call, you'll hear from a group of experts who are on the ground battling this epidemic and what they envision we'll need to defeat the virus. Uh, this past Friday, ASTO, in partnership with Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, uh, released a report framing the urgent need to expand contact tracing capacity at the local, state, territorial, and tribal level. As we prepare for the next phase of COVID-19 response and recovery efforts, the report provides guidance for health agencies so they can begin, begin scaling up the workforce and necessary capacity as our country potentially looks to ease stay-at-home orders and prohibitions on mass gathering. The report includes the finding that 100,000 contact investigators may be necessary for full recovery at the cost of $3.6 billion. Today, we're joined by health leaders who will speak firsthand with how the nation is addressing the deadly epidemic and what recovery plans will look like. Uh, joining me today is John Wiesman, Secretary of Health at the Washington State Department of Health and past president of ASCO. Also, we'll have Dr. Rachel Levine, uh, Secretary of Health at the Pennsylvania Department of Health and president-elect of ASCO. Uh, Monica Burrell, Commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. And Scott Becker, Chief Executive Officer at the Association of Public Health Laboratories. Each speaker will have an opening statement, and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end. This call is on the record, and you should feel comfortable quoting anything you hear from us today. Let's begin with Dr. Wiesman. John, go ahead. Great. Uh, thanks, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. So the current situation in Washington state is that we have a stay home, stay healthy order in place. That order went into effect on March 23rd and at the moment goes through uh, May 4th. Prior to taking uh, that action that our governor took, we did a number of other things such as closing schools, uh, limiting uh, social, recreational, and spiritual gatherings to various group sizes, and restricting visitation to our long-term care uh, settings as well as a number of other uh, measures that we took uh, during that time. Through Monday of this week, we've had 10,694 persons test positive for uh, the COVID-19 and 112,160 that tested negative. And we have 546 deaths with 92% of those deaths occurring in persons uh, for the age of 60 and over. I think as most people know on this call, we were the first in the nation to have a case, uh, identified that case on Monday, January 20th and reported that out on the 21st. So we've been in this response now for 12 weeks, um, 86 days, I think we're at about now. Um, with the outbreak really um, starting and, and uh, being focused initially in the larger Puget Sound area, uh, Snohomish and King Counties, and moving to uh, Pierce County, and then really eventually through the rest of the state. Um, during that time, we had amazing assistance from the Centers for Disease Control. They were on the ground with us for the very first case. Uh, we're with, on the ground in uh, 24 hours of that, helping us manage that case, develop protocols. And uh, we also had 
um, an outbreak, as folks know, in a long-term care facility at the end of February, uh, which was major and had great assistance from the Centers for Disease Control um, at that time to help us with the outbreak investigations in that facility and in um, some other facilities. I think folks know that we requested from the federal government uh, ventilators and uh, field hospitals, and uh, we have been able to sort of achieve our goal of uh, managing and flattening this curve and uh, pushing it out and keeping our healthcare system from becoming the, the uh, hospital system from becoming overwhelmed. And so we've been able to uh, return uh, and release many of those um, assets. Um, in terms of the overall state and where we are, we see um, sort of plateauing um, of number of new cases in some of our areas. We see uh, decreasing in others and uh, still uh, increasing in some places. This really shows the sort of delay in spread across the state uh, by a few weeks um, or so in some of the communities. As I look uh, forward to what we're doing, we are really looking to those measures around disease burden and looking for those to decrease as we further consider our um, uh, next step looking at the number of cases we have, the death, the number of people hospitalized, and really looking for some trends for those um, going down. The future piece here in terms of our focus really is in at least four areas. One is how do we protect those vulnerable populations, those uh, 65 and older, uh, those who have chronic underlying health issues, um, and how we might do that. One of the things our governor did um, this week was issue a proclamation around high-risk employees and worker rights that um, give those people who are at higher risk for um, COVID the um, uh, opportunity for uh, them to essentially uh, have jobs that uh, don't put them um, at risk. And if for some reason um, uh, their employer can't find a job that basically allows them to um, uh, socially distance, then uh, they have the opportunity to essentially gain unemployment um, uh, um, resources and uh, maintain their health insurance uh, by the employer and maintain uh, their ability to go back um, to their job. So um, that's one of the things that we have done on a policy perspective in terms of looking at vulnerable populations. We are also, um, like the rest of the country, very concerned about having the adequate personal protective equipment supplies to protect our healthcare workers, the critical infrastructure, um, those very vulnerable places, long-term care facilities and other congregate settings where we have workers and needing adequate PPE supplies for that is really important to our ability to uh, control um, transmission, especially as we know more about pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic transmission that folks may feel healthy and, and think they're just fine, but actually have the infection with the ability to potentially spread it. And that being a big concern, obviously, for our healthcare workers. Uh, testing and the need to increase testing uh, and to um, have much more availability of that. Uh, we, like other states, are prioritizing the highest risk right now for testing. Um, the supply chain for testing has been uh, quite difficult uh, along the entire spectrum, whether that's getting the materials for the samples, the swabs, viral transport media, uh, so that you can even collect a sample, or uh, pieces around reagents for the labs that are testing, uh, the plastic pipette that, pipette that they need for testing everywhere along the way, the supply chain has been uh, incredibly challenging. And those two things certainly led ASCO, NATO, and LAD, the public health labs um, in the National Emergency uh, Management um, Group to really call on the federal government to increase um, those uh, supply chains. We are also focusing now a great deal on case and contact tracing and improving public health ability to actually be able to handle the large increase 
uh, in cases and contacts and to uh, be able to do that with um, fidelity and uh, consistently with all cases and contacts. So we, like other states, are um, at the very moment working on plans to uh, increase that capacity uh, to make sure that we can uh, fully do uh, that component of our work. And clearly, over time, that capacity has eroded um, as the public health system uh, across the nation uh, really has um, either had decreased funding and certainly not kept up with um, inflation and with population growth. So as we look forward um, to that, these are the things we are focused on, uh, making sure that we can uh, have those things in place as we look to the next steps of modifying the community mitigation measures that uh, we will have in place and, and how we might move forward. I guess I'll just end on the note that, um, you know, the normal as we move out of this is going to be a very different normal than what people are familiar with and used to be. The need for physical distancing, the need for hygiene issues, for environmental sanitation is not going to go away. The, the kinds of behavior changes we're going to need to make are going to need to be sustained uh, for some time, uh, certainly probably until at least we have um, a vaccine. So um, as, as we work with the public and talk with the public, I think it's important that they understand that as states get to a place where they can consider the sort of um, looking at their community mitigation measures, nobody, and I mean nobody, should think that we are going back to what this looked like uh, before we implemented uh, these measures. So with that, I will turn it back over to Nate. Thank you, John. Uh, up next, we'll hear from uh, Rachel Levine, Secretary of Health at the Pennsylvania Department of Health and, and also President-elect of ASCO. Uh, Rachel, I'll turn that over to you. Well, thank you so much, and good afternoon. Uh, so uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, COVID-19 certainly continues to pose a significant public health threat. Uh, to date, we have 26,490 cases of COVID-19. Tragically, we have seen 647 deaths with a death rate of approximately 2.4%. Um, our hospitalization rate uh, is approximately 9%, with 2,339 patients hospitalized. Uh, and 668 of those are on ventilators, which is um, almost 30%, which certainly uh, poses a challenge for our system. Um, in Pennsylvania, the counties that are most affected, although we all 57 counties have cases of COVID-19, are in excuse me, the southeast of Pennsylvania. Uh, that includes Philadelphia and the suburban collar counties of, of Montgomery County, Delaware County, Chester, and Bucks County. And then in the northeast, uh, particularly Lehigh County, uh, where uh, Allentown is, and uh, Luzerne County, where Hazleton is, also Northampton County and Berks County all with significant rates of, of, of COVID-19. Um, our most vulnerable uh, uh, places are, of course, our long-term care living facilities, as Dr. Wiesman had said. Um, in nursing homes, we now have over 3,000 cases, and almost half of our, our deaths are in long-term care living facilities, which include nursing homes and personal care homes. Uh, and so we're having the same challenges uh, in those facilities as, as others, uh, in the country are. Um, under Governor Wolf, we have a, a, a three-pillar strategy. Uh, the first pillar is mitigation. And so, um, as uh, others have done in, in, in many other states, um, we are working to, to mitigate or prevent the spread of this dangerous virus. So that includes a closure of the schools, and now that is for the rest of the school year. That includes the closure of non-essential, non-life-sustaining Businesses. Um, so, examples of life-sustaining businesses would include um, grocery stores and other food shops, uh, pharmacies, um, and also the supply chains, for example, for pharmaceuticals or for food. Um, and, and then finally, uh, a stay-at-home order now for the entire state. Uh, the governor did take a, a sort of moderate, uh, sequential approach to, to uh, stay-at-home orders, starting with Philadelphia and the suburban counties in Allegheny County where Pittsburgh is. But then over the course of about two weeks, uh, we have closed the entire state. Um, our second pillar is in terms of testing. 
trying to expand testing as much as possible through our state lab, through hospital and health systems, and through several drive-through testing laboratories. Um, and we have tried to do that. We have had the same difficulty as Dr. Weissman said in terms of resourcing uh, many different um, uh, components of testing, reagents and chemicals for testing, uh, the swabs, the media, Etc. And that has has uh, posed a significant challenge, and we're uh, make, we're um, working on that every day. And so far, we've been successful at least at least in maintaining testing. And then the third pillar is buttressing our healthcare system for the expected quote unquote surge of cases, include, including supplies, personal protective equipment, ventilators, etc. In terms of alternative care sites um, for patients, and in terms of uh, staffing as well as crisis or emergency standards of care. Um, so, so far, we are, have been successful uh, in addition in terms of, of um, decreasing that curve, in terms of flattening the curve and the number of new cases. Um, uh, uh, last week, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were going up exponentially uh, with the doubling rate every two to three days. Um, uh, the highest peak was uh, last week when we had uh, over 1,900 new cases. Over the last number of days, uh, we're seeing 1,100 new cases. And so we have certainly been able to flatten the curve um, and, and hopefully have at least a plateau in terms of number of the new cases, and then we're, we're looking for decreases. Um, and so that, that has been very successful with our mitigation efforts. Um, as with other states, though, we're now looking about how we might be able to uh, to start to revive the economy and to get uh, patients back, to, uh, individuals back to work, and to uh, try to lift some of the stay-at-home orders. Now, we're not there yet, but we're having those discussions on a regular basis. And the governor has actually just joined other states, including New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and others, uh, with a multi-state uh, collaborative to, uh, to, to to work on that. Uh, this is going to have to go in a slow, progressive fashion. We're not going to have one grand opening of Pennsylvania uh, where the businesses are open and everyone goes back to restaurants. We're going to have to have a slow, iterative approach, to, uh, starting with counties that have been less affected, um, opening up businesses, uh, revising stay-at-home orders, going in a slow, progressive fashion, always watching really carefully through testing and contact tracing for any type of outbreaks. Um, so uh, that's where we are in Pennsylvania, and I'll turn things uh, back to Dr. Smith. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Uh, next up, we'll hear from uh, Dr. Monica Morell, Commissioner of the uh, Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Monica, I turn it over to you. Good afternoon, um, and um, thank you very much for including me with this um, group today. My name is Dr. Monica Brown, I'm the Commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. We'll talk a lot this afternoon about numbers and data, which rightfully is driving our daily decision points related to this pandemic. I would, however, like to start by acknowledging the suffering and loss of life that this virus is causing. Um, if you've lost someone, I want to share my condolences. Or if someone you know is sick, I share my hope for a speedy recovery. Having been infected and thankfully recovered myself, I know firsthand the impact of this virus. For most of us, we've never been confronted with a virus that is this contagious or has had this degree of impact on our daily lives. There have been many lessons learned already for all of us here today including the importance of public health and the importance of the community spirit and looking out for one another. Massachusetts is fortunate to have near universal health care coverage, which we've had for decades. We also have some of the finest teaching hospitals in the world and a robust local system of public health. But even a state like ours has faced an unprecedented challenge from COVID-19. We had our first case of COVID-19 on February 1st, since then, our incident command structure team has been working 24-7 to address this pandemic across several key areas, including increasing testing capacity, social distancing to bend the curve, surge capacities in our healthcare system, and case identification and contact tracing. We have reported 28,163 cases and unfortunately 957 deaths to date since the pandemic began. 
We took an early lead on testing and now have over 25 labs across our state doing up to 5,000 tests a day. We know that in Massachusetts, we are on the upward part of our curve and working hard to increase our capacity to care for individuals with COVID-19 in our healthcare system, as well as continued social distancing to decrease our new cases. A key component of our work to be able to consider loosening social distancing measures will be able to do aggressive case identification and contact tracing and quarantine. And I want to just take a few minutes to talk with you about our work in those areas. Case identification and contact tracing is a long-standing core function of public health. Traditionally, local health departments perform our infectious disease case investigation and contact tracing. Our local health departments are organized here in Massachusetts at a city and town level, and we have 351 independent local health authorities with public health powers alongside those of our state health departments. Many of the local health departments here in Massachusetts have engaged local school nurses and used emergency state resources to add staff to be able to confirm COVID-19 cases and conduct contact tracing and discuss isolation and quarantine recommendations. Our Massachusetts Department of Public Health has augmented these efforts through a collaboration with our Massachusetts Schools of Public Health and organized over 1,600 student volunteers to be trained in COVID-19 case investigation and contact tracing to assist local health departments. In Massachusetts, we've also established the Community Tracing Collaborative, which is a unique partnership to further augment efforts in these areas. The collaboration includes our Massachusetts Department of Public Health, Partners in Health, which is a global health nonprofit located in Massachusetts, and the Commonwealth Health Insurance Connector Authority, which oversees our subsidized health insurance marketing. The unique aspect of this approach is that it aims to boost our existing strong testing and tracing efforts by the local boards of health and leverages an already highly coordinated infrastructure, both human and technology-based, with the goal of ultimately reaching every positive case and their contact to stop, to stop the spread of the virus. The collaborative has received over 15,000 applications for both paid and volunteer positions. It's established a 600-person virtual uh, call center and is looking to hire up to 1,000 people to serve as case investigators, contact tracers, and COVID care resource coordinators. We are ramping up hiring and training, and um, we are using um, um, data to bring all of this information together. The plan is to be able to engage over 840,000 close contacts of COVID-19 cases, refer high-priority cases, such as those living in nursing homes, shelters, and other congregate environments to local health departments, and reduce the contact tracing burden on local boards of health to ensure maximum compliance and quarantine recommendations. This program launched this weekend. And so far, we already have over 500 cases and 300 contacts that have been identified. Um, in summary, our response to this pandemic in Massachusetts will continue 24-7, and we appreciate the many sectors across our state who have responded to addressing this pandemic together, and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Um, up next, we'll hear from our public health partner, Scott Becker, Chief Executive Officer at the uh, Association of Public Health Laboratories. Uh, Scott, I turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Smith. Um, I'd like to touch base on a couple of topics, uh, the status of public health labs and the role of the supply chain, and also serology testing. There are now 95 public health laboratories across the country testing for COVID-19. There's been a lot of statements coming from the Daily White House coronavirus briefings admonishing governors and state labs to do more testing. And I want to explain the situation as it actually exists. All public health labs are using every available laboratory instrument, extraction kit, swab, everything they can use. The federal government is making good on our many asks about expanding the supplies through the International Reagent Resource, or as we call it, the IRR. This is a longstanding distribution mechanism for public health laboratories to use for influenza surveillance 
that's being expanded and repurposed for the pandemic. But it isn't happening overnight simply because there's a global demand for all of the same laboratory supplies as my colleagues have mentioned. Things as basic as swabs to collect the sample. This week, the IRR will get a new supply of 200,000 swabs, which is welcome news. The orders for swabs from public health laboratories alone totals 2.5 million. So clearly, clearly the demand outstrips the supply. The automobile industry can build ventilators, but they can't manufacture lab instruments or reagents. So as we're all learning, this is a huge and painful pinch point. We're also working closely with the FDA, who is both relaxing regulations and expediting um, uh, all forms of of, uh, things that they're able to um, for emergency use authorization approvals and validation. But the fact remains that you can't implement the test unless you have materials to perform the test. So at present, I'd say public health laboratories, and though I don't speak for commercial labs, um, but I, we do we do have frequent conversations with them. Uh, public health labs or commercial labs are near or at capacity. I don't think hospital labs have been able to stand up testing as fast as they would like, largely due to the access to the instruments, to reagent supplies, the, the very things I spoke about. We've talked to countless hospitals that are unable to obtain those supplies, and, and those you know are simply because they've been allocated out to others or it simply doesn't exist. Now, another topic I want to touch on is serology testing. Yesterday, APHL met with the FDA commissioner and members of his leadership team, and as you can imagine, serology was a major topic. We discussed that progress has been made in the following areas. CDC, FDA, BARDA, and NIH have come together to conduct an evaluation of serology tests, which was something that we called for a few weeks ago. We're hopeful that the evaluation will be completed soon and that the data can be made available so that we can get a sense of the quality of the tests that are coming into the U.S. or that are are being produced here. FDA also reported to us that they've continued to step up their enforcement and they have encouraged us to alert them to any fraudulent marketing um, as we become aware of those. And and they are happy to take that information and uh, chase it down. We believe that the emergency use authorization process is still the gold standard, and we are encouraging test developers, manufacturers, our members, and others, whether they're developing new PCR tests or their own serologic assays, to work with the FDA for for an EUA. We really do believe in that quality test. Commissioner Hahn said that we should expect additional EUAs for serologic assays to be posted in the coming days. And uh, we have continued and will continue on ongoing dialogue with FDA because it's been very productive. Some state labs are also beginning evaluation of serology tests on their own, and we agree that we would share that data with them. And serology serology tests do have a role in opening up the country, but it isn't a panacea. And uh, when it's used, we need to ensure that there's good quality tests that are used. Um, So I'll turn it back to you, Dr. Smith. Thank you, Scott. Um, uh, what we've heard uh, has been a um, uh, situation on the ground in terms of moving forward, the importance of case and contact tracing, uh, that this will be a gradual op- reopening process, and uh, the importance of, um, of multi-state collaboratives. Uh, also, Scott has shared with us uh, the expansion of, of, of testing, but also some of the challenges. Um, what I'd like to do now is to go ahead and open it up uh, for uh, questions. And um, uh, we'll use the most of the balance of our time to answer your questions. Hi, thanks so much for holding this call. Um, I was wondering if you could discuss briefly some of the other um, public health issues that may be not getting as much attention um, because of coronavirus. Um, for example, um, Dr. Weissman, I know you're on the HIV uh, ending the epidemic task force. Um, what are going on with some of the other things right now? Thanks for that question. Um, yes, I must say in in many ways, this is an all hands on deck, really focused on uh, COVID. Um, I can personally say that I have done uh, nothing in terms of uh, uh, but really COVID uh, for the last 12 weeks um, and therefore have not uh, done anything on the uh, PATCHO work group in terms of HIV AIDS. 
but I think uh, for communities and locals, um, this is an important issue. We have other outbreaks, uh, you know, that are going on, whether it's hepatitis A outbreaks uh, in our uh, hepatitis um, uh, C outbreaks uh, in our uh, communities um, and the opioid um, uh, uh, epidemic uh, and other sort of issues that go on every day, tuberculosis, et cetera. And, uh, you know, a number of those uh, same resources that would do the case investigations, contact tracing, uh, are really the very resources that are stretched right now. And so, honestly, those are not getting the kind of attention uh, that they need and really goes to this sort of uh, piece of the um, sort of fragile nature of the public health agencies across this country. Um, and uh, so the capacity for us to really address these other issues, you know, you can throw in STDs in there as well, um, is extremely limited uh, right now, uh, which is certainly one of our concerns as well that these other issues don't sort of um, get out of control while we're trying to control COVID. Is anyone, are, are there any other um, health directors on the call who are, have particular concerns about things that may be not overlooked, but um, not getting as much attention as they'd like because of coronavirus and how stressed in the health departments are? Uh, this is Nate Smith. Uh, I think that is one of the big opportunity costs of this uh, pandemic is that many other uh, public health issues uh, have to be set aside for, for a time. Um, Monica and Rachel, your thoughts? This is uh, Rachel Levine. Um, so the, the, the topic that I would like to highlight is the opioid crisis. So what I used to say is the biggest public health crisis of our time was the opioid crisis. Um, but the opioid crisis hasn't gone away. It has changed a bit. Uh, there are changing patterns in terms of substance abuse, in terms of, um, of how substances are obtained. Uh, we are lucky that uh, we have a separate Department of Drug and Alcohol programs. Uh, which is remaining laser focused um, uh, with the uh, the command that the governor set up um, on the opioid crisis. So it has it's not something that I I can can address uh, very much right now since all of our attention is on the global pandemic COVID nineteen. Uh, but others are. But I think that it does have the potential to certainly distract people's attention from you know what remains a significant public health threat, the opioid crisis. This is um, Dr. Burrell here, and I would say a couple of things to highlight. One is that um, it, the structure that we set up in Massachusetts is around a command center um, under Governor Baker related to the pandemic. And at the Department of Public Health, we are continuing our work in other areas. And in many ways, the intersection um, with COVID-19 um, continues in many of our priority areas. So Dr. Levine just mentioned opiates. And in our um, opioid response work, we have focused on ensuring that individuals can continue to get the treatment that they need um, and access um, to treatment during the COVID epidemic. And um, additionally, I would say that many of the um, health equity work, the work areas that we have going on at the Department of Public Health, we have focused those efforts, for example, individuals with homelessness and housing instability, and ensuring that their needs are addressed um, especially as it relates to um, COVID-19. Thank you. We'll take our next question. Caller, please go ahead. Hi there. Thanks for doing the call. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more. I know you touched on this before about the efforts to kind of ease the stay-at-home orders and other social restrictions. Because um, I know that some of your governors are involved in different regional groups to kind of plan guidelines kind of far out. So if you could talk a little bit about that, and secondly, if you're worried about, you know, the federal government kind of overriding that with more of a lax approach that has kind of been hinted at to stimulate the economy. Rachel, do you want to start out with that since you had introduced the idea of the collaborative? Sure. So, um, so we're working on several different fronts with a number of different agencies under the governor's leadership um, on uh, on a path forward, so to speak. And so one is uh, exactly what we talked about. Under what public health circumstances can we, can we start uh, to relax some of the social distancing? Um, and what um, resources do we need 
uh, some, a lot of which Dr. Burrell had mentioned in terms of the ability to do contact tracing, whether that's by, uh, by you know, in person, um, uh, you know, by personal touch, or whether that, some of that could be with, with apps and other types of technology, um, and then uh, the ability to do testing, um, the type of testing uh, that was discussed um, er uh, earlier, particularly the viral testing, but then also, when possible, uh, the uh, uh, Dr. Becker had talked about the, the serology testing, although there are a lot of concerns about some of the, the serology tests that have recently come out that did not have FDA scrutiny. Um, and uh, I think that that would be really important. The other type of issues, of course, are the uh, economic considerations and the social considerations. And so all of that needs to be put together, and we have a number of different uh, work groups and task force to, to look at that. And then um, uh, the governor has just joined a multi-state collaborative um, that had been uh, spearheaded by New York, but also including New Jersey and Connecticut. Uh, in Delaware and other states in terms of uh, trying to have a regional approach uh, to that type of, of, of a path forward. Um, I, I don't think that this can be, I mean, I, we're always uh, pleased to have national leadership, but I think that this, is, this can't be, um, you know, a national opening. I think that that would be very disadvantageous in terms of public health, uh, but it'll have to be, um, you know, regional and state run. Monica or John, do you have anything to add to that? So this is John. I would just add that uh, in uh, the West Coast, we have uh, governors of uh, Oregon, California, and Washington uh, also collaborating to uh, talk about the sort of next steps forward. And again, each state is going to need to do what they uh, do for their state, but looking at some of these common principles and approaches. Uh, that we want to um, uh, take into account in the overall strategy. Um, and we are, you know, identifying those measures that we want to look at that give us some indication about uh, appropriate timing for modifying any of the community mitigation measures. So uh, these, I think we recognize that, um, you know, we really, in terms of geographical boundaries, people travel and move back and forth. And uh, to the extent that we can have common sort of science-based and data-based approaches, uh, that's what we're looking to achieve in these kind of collaboratives. This is Monica Brell. I'd add in Massachusetts, um, the pandemic is still on the upswing. And as we just report, reported, uh, we unfortunately are seeing continued increases in deaths to their um, total of 957. When the time comes to think about reopening our economy, um, we have to do it strategically and safely because the worst possible outcome of reopening public life would be a second wave of this pandemic. Um, and we're going to do what's right um, for the people of Massachusetts. And right now, that's having people stay home, do the social distancing, and observe all of the measures that we've put in place. Thank you. Can we go ahead and have the next question? Hi, um, thanks so much for taking my call. Um, I, I was wondering, I'm sorry to say two questions. Um, one, what do you see as the next step for testing in the U.S.? And two, along similar lines, the administration has said it's considering prioritizing testing for those from minority backgrounds. Is that factoring into your decision-making process at the state level? If so, how much? And are you looking at other categories as well? Hi, this is Scott Becker. I'll, I'll take the first part of that in terms of sort of the next steps. I, I think we're we're looking um, first for the expanded supply chain. Um, we want to continue to bring up and expand as, as much diagnostic testing, the PCR testing as we can. We're, we're looking forward to additional high-quality um, point-of-care instruments, things, things that can be closer to the patient that can be put in clinics, et cetera. But again, the supply chain is really critical there. And then, as I mentioned earlier, I think serology is going to play a role. Um, so we want to look uh, we want to look towards that as well. And I'll let the, uh, the state health officials talk about the, uh, the additional questions. Uh, so this is uh, Rachel Levine from, from Pennsylvania. So I would agree with Dr. Becker that in, in terms of uh, the supply chain, so uh, you know uh, the Abbott test that has been highlighted uh, is, is a very good test. It can 15 minutes. It can be done point of care. Uh, but we've had great difficulty getting the test kits 
um, for the platforms. And so uh, it does, does limit its utility um, if we can't get the test kits to be able to expand it, to expand it widely. Uh, we have some other platforms. We have about uh, five different platforms at our state health lab, and we keep having to juggle which one we use depending upon the reagents that, that, that we can get. So that supply chain of reagents as well as the, the right swabs, the right media, et cetera, is critical to, be, to, to expand PCR testing. I think it will be really critical in the future to have a rapid point-of-care test, uh, perhaps even a home test, but, but to, to be able to do you know, rapid testing. Of course, the sensitivity and specificity is critical, and I think that there will be a role for antibody testing. But uh, but Scott has pointed out uh, significantly that we have to make sure it's an it's an accurate test with good sensitivity and specificity, and then we really need to know that you know, that antibodies are are, are truly protective um, and that and see how long lasting they are. Um, I think it will be important. I don't know if prioritize would be the right word, but we have to make sure that we that we access. Um, uh, vulnerable communities and, and, and make sure that the testing is where the patients are and that they have access to testing. So I guess that's a prioritization in, in one point of view, but we have to make sure that we test, um, you know, uh, the minority groups that otherwise don't necessarily always have access to health care, particularly uh, members of the Hispanic community and African American community. Uh, there's been discussions about the LGBTQ community as well. So I think that that's really important and we're working on that in Pennsylvania. This is Monica Burrell. I'll add to that that in Massachusetts, our goal is to expand our testing capacity so that we can continue to isolate positive cases and prevent further spread. At the state public health laboratory, we are prioritizing um, hot spots and places where you're seeing increased um, outbreaks as they occur um, and are working hard to also improve the data that we collect in order to understand where those hot spots are. As some examples, um, we have had some hot spots in places such as um, our congregate living sites, homeless shelters, as um, well as our nursing home facilities and long-term care facilities, and some of their uh, prioritized testing there, as well as putting out um, a mobile testing program, which prioritizes some of these areas as well, and being able to access, um, as Dr. Levine was mentioning, the supplies to expand this testing is critical for us as well as we, too, are looking forward um, to self-testing and other ways of doing rapid testing to enhance our capacity. And this is John. I'll just ditto exactly what my colleague said. And um, uh, we're in the same place and with the same approaches and priorities. Hi, um, this is Gabby Galvin from U.S. News. Thank you so much for doing this. This is, this is really helpful. Um, each of you has emphasized the role of contact tracing um, as we kind of move, look for this next phase. Um, and we heard a lot about the new initiative in Massachusetts, but I'm wondering, Dr. Um, Weisman and Dr. Levine, can you describe exactly where you are in those efforts and, and what kind of measures or um, initiatives, programs, et cetera, that you're considering to shore up the public um, health workforce in your state to do that kind of widespread uh, contact tracing? Great. This is John Wiesman. I can start. Uh, so we, like Massachusetts, have uh, local health departments who have uh, this as their primary uh, function. And um, we have 35 local health departments in Washington state. Uh, they have uh, uh, done uh, the contact tracing and case investigation with support from the state. Uh, the state has uh, given in uh, doing that for about four or five jurisdictions who asked us um, to do that work. Uh, but like uh, Monica indicated, the capacity has been uh, essentially overwhelmed. And we are in the, yesterday and today in the very same kind of conversations that Monica is talking about and, and doing uh, with um, our folks in terms of beefing up our um, workforce capacity. Um, and we are also talking with community partners about any assistance that they might provide with that. So it's an active conversation that is literally happening uh, yesterday and today. Uh, and so we are looking to also shore up and further build that capacity to do a much larger uh, number of case and contact investigations, especially as we're all asking for this testing capacity to increase 
that means we are going to find more cases out there because we know that the tests that are coming in right now are just a fraction um, of what's out there. And having had to prioritize the testing, uh, we know that many people know that they have COVID and really are not having the access to testing. So that means the public health system uh, has to scale up and scale up very quickly. Uh, that's the call for certainly resources at the federal level. Um, and uh, it's clear, I think, uh, to us that while in Washington state, we, you know, uh, may, may be at this plateau as compared to accelerating, um, that uh, with the uh, efforts we're making now, uh, we're going to sort of stay at a plateau and not decrease. So we need to redouble and re-triple efforts um, here around uh, the pieces of case and contact investigation, uh, getting those, uh, getting folks tested so they actually know, um, and then working on isolation and quarantine. Uh, this is Rachel Levine. It, it is remarkable that on completely different coasts, um, I would echo um, uh, Dr. Weissman's uh, comments. And so we have had discussions over the last number of days about how we're going to do this. Uh, we will need to beef up our workforce. We also have county and municipal health departments, but only 10. Um, and uh, um, except for Philadelphia and Erie, uh, mostly on the eastern side of the state. Um, so we're going to need to, uh, to beef up our workforce. Uh, that might be in addition to hiring, might be volunteers. Uh, we have a lot of people, students, public health students, medical students, other students that want to help that we might be able to help in terms of contact tracing. I also think that, the, that there's an opportunity for technology. Uh, there are a number of different uh, technological platforms that can help with contact tracing. We've heard of, 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 of one called the Sarah Alert. We have one that is discussions with Google and Apple and, and others how technology could help with contact tracing. But I really will need to be, a, uh, from the public health perspective, um, uh, being able to uh, do testing, uh, to be able to do uh, appropriate isolation, contact tracing, and quarantine um, as we slowly, um, in, in a progressive fashion, um, try to open up. Uh, we are um, hopefully plateaued. Um, we'll see. Um, the University of Washington uh, model um, uh, indicates that tomorrow is our surge from a healthcare point of view, and an and on Saturday is our surge in terms of deaths. Uh, there are lots of different models out there, so we'll see. Um, but uh, as, as you know, late, uh, not right now, but in the future, when we start to uh, to open up, we're going to need to do it in a very careful way to prevent uh, a second surge, as Dr. Burrell had talked about. Can we have the next question? Hi, this is Jesse Hellman with the Hill. Thanks so much for doing this call. Um, I just kind of wanted to get at the issue of the lack of supplies, the agents, blogs, stuff like that, um, and how that squares with the talk that we are hearing about needing to continue to ramp up testing to um, so we can reopen parts of the country as quickly as possible. And what do you need to see from the federal government or others to increase the development of, of those supplies? Good to see Scott Becker. I'll start. Um, I, I think that you, you hit on a really important point. I mean, we're at a really critical juncture and the supply chain has not yet caught up. Um, it is growing. It's growing every week. I'm really pleased to to, uh, to get that information from the Laboratory Diagnostic Task Force from the White House. Um, but, you know, the, the companies also are, I believe, doing as, as much as they can. I do wonder what the role of the uh, Defense Production Act could be. I, I, as I said earlier, it's not the same as ventilators, so it's not necessarily the machine the instruments, but it's the supplies, the reagents, the chemicals, the plastics, all of those kinds of things. Um, I, I honestly believe that companies are really doing as much as they can. I don't think anyone is slacking. Um, this is just a, a really a difficult, difficult situation. Again, because it's not, a, it's not a localized outbreak. This isn't a national outbreak. This is a global pandemic. And, um, you know, we've never experienced in the in the country, the demand for testing that we that we have here, we didn't see this in in H one N one. We didn't see it certainly in SARS and MERS, which were very different kinds of things. This is a very different kind of um, of illness, and um, 
I, I really don't have a great answer for you, and I, I wish I did. Um, but I, I do think that the funding is very helpful that's going to come to states. Um, there's definitely talk in, in the next supplemental as to you know what other industries should get as well. Uh, it, it's just a really, really tough time that we're, that we're facing right now. We have the next question. Hi, thank you for taking the call. This is Mike Toby of the Associated Press. Hey, I'm uh, I'm calling you from New York City, which uh, where they yesterday um, started counting probable cases that did uh, made their death count jump uh, uh, significantly. I was wondering uh, across the state, the state health departments, do they mainly report uh, only lab confirmed uh, illnesses as cases and deaths? And is that changing or about to change? Uh, this is Rachel Levine from Pennsylvania. So good timing. Uh, we have just started to add probable cases uh, to our case count. It, it's a very small percentage at this point. It'll probably grow. Um, but uh, that just happened this week, that we're adding probable cases to our case count. How about the other states? And what's the norm across the country? This is Nate. The norm across the the country is really just to report confirmed cases, and the reason is that there's a lot of a lot of uh, illnesses, particularly uh, springtime illnesses, that can uh, mimic, especially the early symptoms of COVID-19. So most states are just are just reporting uh, lab confirmed positives. Uh, John and Monica, are you all uh, reporting probables at this point? In Washington, we're not, um, and uh, we have really not had this conversation uh, in part for the reasons that uh, Dr. Smith just mentioned, um, and uh, I'll be interested in having further conversations with my colleagues. In Massachusetts, we're not yet, but I'm interested in learning more about this. Uh, this is Rachel again. I mean, one of the reasons why we started to do that is that uh, CSPE, which is the National Epidemiological Society has, has worked to come up with a specific case definition, and so uh, uh, probable cases is included in that case definition. But again, this is Wednesday, and it started Monday. Did you receive any communication from the CDC uh, guiding you in reaction to the CSPE uh, definition? I'd have to check with our state epidemiologist, um, but I believe that all that is consistent with CDC. Typically, what happens is CDC and CSPE work together on a case definition, and then it's then it's rolled out. Then uh, uh, that's not just true for COVID nineteen, but for other conditions. Um, this has been a great discussion, and I'm sure there are many, many other questions that uh, that we uh, we could engage with. Unfortunately, we're running short on time. I want to thank everyone for all the great questions. Uh, COVID-19 has caused economic and health consequences nationally across the globe. Uh, ASSO has urgently called upon Congress and the administration to further support the growth of our contact investigation workforce by providing resources and flexibility that states and territories need to rapidly expand and accelerate case finding and contact tracing capacities within our existing public health system. Our nation's uh, health officials are planning for this rapid expansion. We're looking forward to federal support to quickly move forward. I'd like to thank my colleagues on the line today for their hard work and dedication to defeat this virus. I'd also like to thank all the media on today's call for your countless hours of reporting and keeping the nation on top of what's happening. That's an extremely important function. Thanks, everyone, for joining today. Stay safe and be well. And um, Thank you for partnering with us on this.